Good evening. You're watching Channel G. It's 9pm, and coming up later will be Kittens with Bagpipes, the mid-season finale. But first, it's our topical news program, at least 10 minutes. With YouTube in meltdown over an advertiser pullout and with famous YouTubers forced to resort to begging on the street for scraps, we ask the hard-hitting questions. Is this an overreaction? Don't Nazis also buy things? Is this all a knee-jerk reaction on the part of YouTube and on the part of the advertisers? All that tonight in at least 10 minutes. Good evening, I'm Raleigh Hughcock and this is at least 10 minutes. YouTube is in crisis, as perhaps one in a thousand times an advert has been delivered to hateful channels with hardly any traffic. This crisis hasn't only hit the Turbo Hitler channel and the Two Minutes Hate, nor has it only hit Nazi Midget Pool. No, many ordinary channels have also been caught up in this advertising blitz storm, losing their funding, losing their viability, perhaps even losing their jobs. The scandal broke when the Wall Street Journal and the Times of London broke the story that controversial content was appearing next to advertising or vice versa from certain companies and asking the advertisers whether they endorsed the material against which their advertising was appearing. Despite this being the way that YouTube and indeed a great deal of online advertising has worked for years and years and years, it appears that some people still associate the advertiser with the content and take their advertising to be some kind of endorsement. According to a poll commissioned by an online site, some one third of people still think this way and we have exclusive footage of exactly the kind of person that thinks this interrelationship still exists. The world's oldest living person, Emma Morano, celebrated her 117th birthday on Tuesday. Many of the channels hit were unambiguously hateful, using words such as nigger or saying the word cunt, 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 over and over again, thereby seemingly justifying their label as being not family friendly. And when we say not advertiser friendly, what we really mean is not family friendly, though it seems to be a peculiar dichotomy in that these same companies that are pulling out of YouTube on these kind of worries are perfectly happy to have their products being sold alongside news items about war, murder, disease, famine, crushing poverty and all kinds of other inhumanity to humanity. Earlier I spoke to Brett McLarge Huge, manager for one of the largest advertising companies in the world, handling many of these advertising contracts between these large companies and YouTube, and I asked him whether this wasn't just a knee-jerk reaction to the kind of old-fashioned media that barbarously still prints its news on dead trees. Mr. McLarge Huge, isn't this just a grotesque overreaction to the kind of barbarous old-fashioned media that still prints its news on dead trees? Powerful words from McLarge Huge, however that is only perhaps one third of the greater story. YouTube, of course, is being complicit in what's going on and doesn't appear to have made any particularly strenuous arguments for the validity of their approach or to have offered much of a salve to the many YouTubers who are being incredibly financially hit by this. The scattershot approach, the shotgun blast, which is taking out not only hate channels, but horror channels, news channels, commentary channels, channels of all kinds. Fortunately, I managed to secure an interview with a member of the YouTube team about this and I asked them, isn't this just a knee-jerk reaction to paranoid companies who don't really understand how any of this works? So, uh, Gaylord, m may I call you Gaylord? Isn't this just a knee-jerk reaction to paranoid old companies who don't really understand how any of this works? Many have observed that this sudden attack on YouTube comes at an awfully convenient time. In the background of the recent elections, the increasing issues and distrust of the mainstream media, it seems awfully convenient that alternative media has come under such stress. 
led by the old guard media. Many people have offered conspiracy theories, suggesting that this is some sort of coordinated attack. We talked to a lead proponent of this theory, Dave Cullen of Computing Forever. Whether there is indeed some kind of enormous lizard person conspiracy behind this or not, the implications for free speech and free expression online are particularly concerning. YouTube has been cracking down for some time on controversial free expression, as have other social sites such as Facebook, Twitter and so forth, leaving very few alternatives for those who wish to speak their mind freely. While this is not governmental censorship or really censorship at all in the conventional sense, it is a form of soft censorship. By removing the financial incentive, the ability for people to support themselves by doing these kinds of projects, it removes people's ability to produce as much content, to research it, to polish it, to present it to the level of quality that they might otherwise be able to. It also removes a great deal of their motivation, forcing people to return to a hobbyist stance. This will necessarily have the de facto effect of censoring a great deal of opinion and allowing those older, more conventional companies to reassert themselves upon the field. Earlier I interviewed Professor Jordan Peterson, a noteworthy campaigner on free expression issues, particularly within academia in Canada, and I got his reaction to what's going on and the effect that he thought it would have upon free expression online. Uh, good, good afternoon Professor, can you hear me? Hi ho, Kermit the Frog here. In in your own words, Professor, could you could you please tell us exactly how deleterious an effect you believe this will have on online free expression? Yeah! And and in the current context, uh, given the inevitable rise of online media and its importance in the cultural landscape, how bad of an effect do you believe it will have on the the broader culture that we all experience? Yeah! So, uh, any any parting thoughts? I mean, how serious is this? Should we really be as upset? Should we should we panic to the degree that people are panicking? <coughs> A truly, truly chilling interpretation of events from Professor Peterson there. The YouTube community itself does seem to be banding together across old party lines to protest what's going on. Earlier restriction issues ended up with a lot of LGBT and other progressive material also being effectively censored in the new application of the restricted mode, and this caused a great deal of fuss and problems and the aforementioned alliances across old divides. Nonetheless, the mood seems grim, and many YouTubers are now being forced to beg. T-shirt sales are going up, many people are begging for donations to their Patreons. All sorts of alternative measures are being sought to make up the revenue that's being lost, though the degree to which this will be a success, especially as this problem drags on, remains to be seen. Just how bad can it be? Well, let's go live to our field reporter, Lank Meatloaf, reporting live embedded within the YouTube skeptic community. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by rocking cradle. And what rough beast it's hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Thank you, Lank. So then, is this really the end of the world for YouTube? Probably not. There's some glimmers of hope out there already. Already some advertisers are coming back. YouTube seems to have managed to reassure them. Once they've reassured the advertisers, it will then be a longer, slower process of reassuring YouTube creators, tweaking their algorithms and getting their bots to work properly, rather than as the over-eager terminators they're currently acting as. Cold comfort in the short to medium term, I'm sure, for many YouTubers who essentially rely on advertising money in order to get by. However, what may result from all this is a leaner, stronger YouTube with creators diversifying their sources of income. Patreon, sales, merchandising, 
all manner of other things. It also may see people diversify to other platforms, which is something that's sorely needed across social media. Currently, the big giants, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, have far too much dominance and control, and that's why something like this can have such a far-reaching and major impact on YouTube creators. As usual with YouTube, the real underlying problem appears to be the complete lack of communication. Like a long, dysfunctional marriage, YouTube seems to be completely unable to communicate with its partners in any meaningful way. And so long as that continues, these problems and panics will continue. YouTube creators simply don't know what the rules are. They cannot understand in any way why any particular video is necessarily demonetized, and there seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. Once you know the rules, of course, people will find ways around them, but without knowing the rules, normal creators, who aren't making anything horrible, will continue to be affected. And this will continue to cause problems leading forward into the future. Unless YouTube solves this communication problem, this will just continue to happen on a regular basis every time they tweak something. Still, this reporter's advice is to batten down the hatches, rely on your audience to carry you over, and hopefully, eventually, everything will sort itself out. It'll all be over by Christmas. I'm Riley Hucock, and that was about 10 minutes. Remember, it's just the internet. That was about 10 minutes, and now the mid-season finale of Kittens and Bagpipes. <laughs>